Hello, and uh, a very good evening to everyone from uh, Mumbai, India, and a warm, warm welcome to all our colleagues, homeopaths, students, doctors from across the globe. So it, uh, I'm really, really happy to uh, introduce today's session on today's day, which is the World Homeopathy Day, which is a very, very special day for all of us. And um, uh, this year around, we felt the best uh, contribution or uh, what we could give back to the system is to, um, you know, show skills, uh, the progress made by some of our best uh, students. Now I would say colleagues of uh, some of our most uh, important, our flagship course, the master's course over the past many years. So it gives us immense pride to, to have them on this platform where the likes of Dr. Sankaran uh, to all the great teachers have been teaching for so many years. So as, as I say that we are very proud that they are uh, now colleagues and walking like shoulder to shoulder with all of us. And uh, it's, it's, it's a really, really uh, proud and happy moment for all of us to now see them uh, at what, where they have grown, the successes they have achieved in their practices, uh, and um, you know how they are contributing their bit for homeopathy. So I will just uh, give uh, the stage to my colleague, Dr. Priyanka. She will introduce today's speakers, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah. Hello, everyone. A good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody all over the world. We welcome you on the behalf of Hope Prada. I'm Dr. Priyanka. I'm a student in Adasong Academy. I'm presently doing master's course in Adasong Academy. In today's session, the first, first speaker is Dr. Kyle. Uh, Dr. Kyle is a homeopath from Durban, South Africa. He obtained his master's degree in homeopathy from the Durban University of Technology. He also spent six months in India completing a master's course in advanced homeopathy from the Adasong Academy and Clinic. He headed by, headed by the renowned homeopath and healer, Dr. Rajan Sankaran. Since then, he, he has continued his homeopathic career in India, firstly interning at the Adasong Academy, and then becoming involved in the organization and teaching of the international courses in advanced homeopathic approach, approaches to the homeopathy from all over the world. Along with furthering of homeopathic education, he enjoys the clinical aspects of homeopathic practice, working in rural clinics in Africa, as well as seeing patients in his private practice. Currently, he is also co-mentoring the Gurukul Advanced Practitioner course. And his topic for today is superclass approach in clinical practice. If you have any queries in the session, can be mentioned in the chat box, chat box and they'll be answered in the end of the session. And now Dr. Kyle will take over the session. Welcome, sir. Thanks very much, Dr. Pranko. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be with you this evening. Uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, so my topic for today is the superclass approach in a clinical setting. So as mentioned in, uh, kindly by Dr. Priyanka, I've been working uh, these last few years a little bit with uh, Dr. Sankran, especially around these ideas of the superclass. And uh, so I would just like to show some aspects from my practice and how I've uh, sort of tried to apply them, especially in clinical settings. Often we hear, um, practitioners, especially practitioners from maybe more rural areas, uh, where they battle with the sensation method. Uh, they say that they, they can't take the patients deeper. Um, and so I would like to talk a little bit about this and uh, share some of my experiences where I've seen good success with the sensation method, and particularly how the super, super class can help us in this area. So as mentioned, um, I, yes, I studied at the other song in India. But um, I've also spent a lot of time in South Africa working at the Kula Natural Health Center. So this is a rural clinic um, in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. And they really do amazing work. I would advise everyone to look into them. 
to see about uh, maybe volunteering and, and seeing what you can do there. This is a really great place to practice homeopathy. Uh, these patients are, are very poor. They come from a very rural area. Sometimes they travel four, five hours in a, in a minibus just to come there. They have nothing. They have no money. They have no food. So they really, really um, are reliant on us for health care. And it's a pure, purely homeopathic clinic. We only give homeopathy. And we have amazing results there. And the, uh, I would like to show some of them today. So in the, these type of settings, how does our system help us? The system that we use, homeopathy. And we all know the statement, similia, similibus, currentia. So we'll talk about that, you know. How do, how do we implement it when we say like cures like? What are we referring to? Um, what needs to be alike? And that will be sort of um, the main emphasis of the superclasses as well. Up until now, in the last maybe 200 years of homeopathic practice, that like was based on sort of symptom similarity. We would see symptoms in the patient and we would match them to symptoms in a remedy. Then, um, Dr. Sankaran came along and he added uh, two more sort of conceptual uh, elements to this, which we could use as likes. He added the miasm and the kingdom approach. And with this, there's been a lot of success in people's practices. Uh, homeopathy has flourished using this approach, um, using these coordinates to help find the remedy, along with symptom, symptom, uh, symptom similarity. We don't leave that behind, but rather we add it synergistically. So these last 30, 40 years, this has been going on. And now in the last two to three years, uh, we've seen a new uh, coordinate, the superclass. And so how can we add this into our sort of um, our practice? How do we become more accurate in our matching of like? So just a brief overview of some of these concepts. We have the kingdom concept. So this is the perception. How does the patient perceive what is happening to them? Do they see it as an I? Something is happening to I. I lack, I loss, I'm losing. This is the mineral perception, okay? Where they feel that they, they don't have the capability. They are missing something within them, within their structure, something is missing. If we see the, the experiences through the main function of something, something has happened, which I'm sensitive to, and I react. This is the plant kingdom. For example, if we look at the Loganaceae family, we can see remedies like Ignatia. So, uh, something happens, there's some trauma in the family, and there's huge shock, grief, with numbness, paralysis. Something has happened, and I react to it. So this is the plant kingdom. Then if the patient the paradigm of somebody, somebody is doing something to me, um, I am a victim, they are an aggressor, this is the animal kingdom. We see the idea of hierarchy coming as well. Then if we see the experience is of it, it is hectic, it is controlled, it is destructive. They're completely um, absorbed within the, uh, within the experience itself. This is when a nozode is needed. This is the kingdom of the nozode. So this is uh, the kingdom approach. We see how the patient experiences their daily life. And using that, we have a coordinate we now know that the remedy that we need to choose needs to be from that kingdom. Next was the miasm. What is the speed, the depth, and the perception of the disease? Is it acute? Is it very sudden? Is it typhoid? Is there a sudden crisis? Is it malaria, where we see this sort of uh, intermittent harassment, persecution, where it comes up suddenly and we have to have a huge crisis? Is it soric, where there's a big struggle? or a uh, ringworm where we, uh, we try and then we give up. Psychosis, we, we try to avoid something, we anticipate it, and then we end up accepting it, we live with it. The cancer miasm, where it's, it's gone out of our control. Everything is too much for us and we have to go beyond our limits to bring it back into control. In the tuberculum miasm, it's too hectic, everything is too much, it's oppressive. We can no longer breathe in this situation. We just have to get out, we have to break away. And now in the leprous miasm, we feel isolated, cast aside, left out. And it's uh, very despairing. And then in the syphilitic miasm, 
it's complete despair. We've given up hope. We are sur completely surrounded by enemies. So this is the kingdom and the miser. These are two factors which we've been working with successfully in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And along with uh, our sort of peculiar and particular symptoms and also source qualities, we were coming to the remedy um, quite successfully. But how can we be even more accurate and be more consistent in our results? And the best way to do this is to add an extra coordinate. If we're working with five coordinates, the chance of being that much more accurate is much higher. And so this new coordinate, the superclass, is much more of a general overview of the patient. We see a sort of basic or a fundamental dynamic within the patient. How do they respond to everyday things? What is their basic nature and the response? This leads us to the superclass. So in the first superclass, this basic dynamic is that of withdrawal or clinging. They go within their shell. They, it, the outside world is too much for them. They can't cope up with it. They have to go inside. They have to shut it out. So we see this going into the shell, shutting off, clinging, holding onto someone. And then in the, super, in the second superclass, we see the idea of opening and shutting. This is the dynamic of going inside but it gets a little bit boring. So we come out and we look, but if there's danger outside, we quickly go back inside. So we're peeping out, we're seeing if it is safe. It's like a window. We can look out, but if it's too dangerous or scary, we can immediately close it. However, it becomes dull and gray and monotonous inside. So we see this need for sensory stimulation. We want to taste things, smell things. We want colors, we want sound, we want touch. We want things to be colorful, bright, alive. In the third superclass, it's the idea of limiting and expanding. We are in the safe area, but we, can no long, we can't uh, go beyond the limit of that safe area. We have to expand within it. To go beyond our limit is therefore risky, and we have to risk stepping beyond the limit, which becomes quite dangerous. So usually we try to find expansion within the limit, within our safety zone. So we keep within the limited space. We stay within the family. We sort of rely on them for love, nourishment, and care. And uh, to go against the family is then to leave that safe space of love, care, and nourishment. So we stay small. We don't risk. Um, but we then don't have any adventure. We don't meet new people or face uh, new situations. We stay within these limits. Now in the fourth superclass, we've reached an area of stability. We no longer have this limit around us. We are quite stable. However, if anything happens, it threatens the stability. It threatens our status quo. So we are constantly on the lookout for anything that could change that, that could change our stability or status quo, that could risk our being settled. So we have to find this place of stability. We have to create security all around us, our home, our business, our job. We have our family, our money. And we try to avoid any instability. In the fifth superclass, there's a lot of restlessness. We need to get out. We feel stuck and almost claustrophobic in our place of safety. We can no longer stay there. The place that once was safe is now dangerous to us. It becomes very claustrophobic, very dangerous for us. So the feeling is of being stuck and suffocated and that we have to get out, escape. We have to run, we have to move. In the sixth superclass, we see a lot of violence and destruction. We're now totally outside, we've escaped, we've gotten out from the fifth superclass, but now we're completely exposed and there's violence and destruction everywhere. There's lots of, uh, the idea is a lot of big things are happening. This is in contrast to the first superclass where little things affect us. Uh, we are pierced and uh, very, very sensitive to trifles. But in the sixth superclass, the opposite, 
we see lots of big things, catastrophes, huge impact from the outside world. And so in this, in this uh, sixth superclass, we have the idea of fight and flight. The enemies are all around us and there's a lot of danger. And we have to take on a very big responsibility in the sixth superclass. We have to take charge. We have to be responsible for others. It's the idea of the dictator. Within the idea of the dictator, you have the terrorist, but you also have the idea of the benevolent dictator, the person who takes on very hard decisions for other people. Um, that person who has to fight and fight to the finish. So these are the six uh, superclasses. And we can see this, uh, this shift in the dynamic from the first to the sixth. From the first, we're very much inside, withdrawn. And we slowly start coming out. In the second one, we just peep out a little bit, but then go back in. In the third, we, we expand the limit of that shell, of that protection. In the fourth, we're now a bit more outside. We're stable. We're beyond the limit. But we're always looking for that stability and security. In the fifth, we're completely getting out now. We want to be outside. In the sixth, now we're completely in the open. And we can see these ideas of the dynamic also in the way that we respond to crises. So the idea of the crisis response is in the first superclass, there's complete panic. Something happens like there's a fire and there's complete panic and withdrawal. We go into our shell. We can't react. We become paralyzed and numb. In the second superclass, when there's the fire, initially we have the panic like the first superclass, but then we need to sort of look how bad is it? We need to do a sort of danger assessment. If it's too dangerous for us, if it's too scary, we then completely withdraw like the first. So there's a little bit of inertia. There's not too much movement in the second superclass. We're staying within the shells still and basically looking out a little bit. In the third superclass, we see some striving. We're now trying to put out the fire. We're actively fighting the fire. We're doing our best, but it's all within our own limitation. As soon as it becomes too dangerous, we, in, we won't step beyond the limitation. We'll stay within our safety zone. We'll see within these uh, crisis responses that the further we go down in the response, that we have a little bit of all of them. So someone in the third superclass will go through the first superclass response of panic. Then they'll have a little bit of inertia and then they'll strive. Then in the fourth superclass, we have the idea of coping. We're now beyond the limit and we have to cope with the fire. We have to do our best. We have to put it out. And we sort of have to maintain the status quo. Then in the fifth superclass, we go beyond. We get, we get out of the box. We have out of the box thinking. We have mastery. The element of mastery now comes in where we now have to come up with new ways to fight fires, to be better at putting out uh, these crises. We develop new tools, we invent. And this is getting out of the box, it's movement, it's going forward. And then once we get into the sixth superclass, the idea of leadership, we now have to avoid such massive uh, problems, destructions. We can see that these fires are happening everywhere in our society. And we need to take on the, the huge load of responsibility to prevent this from happening again. We need to come up with new laws in some way. We need to pass a law that prevents this from happening. We have to be the leader. So we can see how uh, the different superclasses will react in a crisis. This is a very fundamental thing within us. And we can see that when we think of any crisis, if we just look inside and we do this thought experiment, what is our basic experience and response? What do we want to do? Do we want to stay inside? Do we want to get out? Where do we belong? And we'll start to see this uh, sort of resonance with the superclass. Now, along with uh, this basic dynamic, we can also see certain qualities which go along with it. There are a lot, uh, with the responses, we can see the sort of qualities or the nature of the person, their basic nature, which would respond to this dynamic. So here we have two uh, columns with different qualities. And there's a spectrum between them. So in the first row, we have submissive, submissiveness and uh, stubborn. 
So submissive is on the left-hand side. So particularly in the first three superclasses, the, uh, the person would be a lot more mild, yielding, more submissive. And a good example of this is pulsatilla, which is in the first superclass. Pulsatilla, very mild, yielding, gentle. They don't want to cause any problems. So they just withdraw into their shell. They allow whatever to go, to go on. They don't want to create a problem. But in the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth, we see the stubbornness increasing. The person becomes more stubborn. They become more confrontational in a sense. We can think of Nux Vomica, which is in the sixth superclass. And here they're very zealous. They have highly temperamental, fiery temperament, Fatak says. So we can see this quality where they have to take on responsibility. They need the stubbornness in terms of bearing the responsibility. If you're mild and yielding, you can't lead. You can't take control of the situation, especially if it's such a destructive one. So if we go through this table, we'll see this whole um, dynamic and the qualities as well. This table is very, very useful in, in case taking. When we are sitting with our patient, we can try to understand where does the patient fit? And we can even use this table to mark off. So if we're seeing a lot of qualities in the third, we can see that they're sort of submissive, um, but not that submissive. Then we put them in the third, if they're more on the left-hand side. And then we can start thinking that this patient might belong to the third superclass, along with the dynamic that we see. Do we see the idea of limiting? Do we see the desire to expand within that limited space? This would lead us to the third superclass. So this is a very useful chart. And in fact, we've given it to many patients as well and asked them to fill it in about themselves. And we've seen some, some results, some good results, showing a, a sort of correlation between the remedy that we gave and the superclass that they mark themselves in. When we see that it matches with the case and what we can see in the patient, it becomes highly indicative of the superclass. So this is a, a table that basically sums up these ideas of the superclass and the remedy groups that belong to each. So it's quite um, expansive and there's a lot of information and I've gone through a lot of information very, very quickly, but I just wanted to give a very quick overview because actually I would like to move into some cases now to show how we actually see it in a case example and how to use it in difficult cases. So just to go very quickly, we'll see here the dynamic of withdrawal and clinging in the first, and the remedy group that we'll see for the animals are the bivalves, which are the, the mollusks, like Martulus edulis, which is the muscle. We'll see uh, Venus mercenaria, uh, those sorts of remedies. We'll also see the left-hand side of the second row. So this is lithium, beryllium, and boron. Um, we'll also see the first subclass of the plants. This is the magnolidae. So we can see um, remedies like pulsatilla, we can see staphysagria, we can see helleborus, opium, nux muscata. And um, so this is the basics of the first superclass. Now, I see already that there's a lot of people asking about information, is there a book? Uh, Dr. Sankaran has nearly finished the book. We will be releasing that very, very soon. So there's a lot of information there. But also uh, we do uh, have quite a lot of information in the form uh, of our, uh, our learning course, uh, the Sankaran Masterclass. Um, especially in the fifth level of the course, you will learn a lot about the superclasses and also the WISE process. And the WISE processes are also extremely important in the development of the superclass and also in trying to um, sort of take out the superclass on the case, to get to the depth of the case, and then to identify the superclass. So these are the, the general overview of the different uh, superclasses. Um, and so I thought I would try and talk about a topic that's, um, that I see a lot in, in clinical cases, um, but it also has a, some difficulties. And this one that I'm talking about today will be about convulsions, things like epilepsy. And so just if we Google uh, the medical definition of a convulsion in Google, we come up with this, uh, this statement that convulsions are rapid involuntary muscle contractions 
that cause uncontrollable shaking and limb movement. Okay, so now if we go through our Materia Medica and we look, you know, at all our different uh, very important convulsion remedies, they will all say something about this, you know, it, they all look very similar at a, at a close, uh, when we first look at the Materia Medica, they can be quite hard to differentiate, especially in a clinical setting, in an, in an acute setting, where patients are having, you know, multiple attacks in a day or a week, and they're very severe, it can be quite frightening to deal with. And now we have to try and find a remedy and put a stop to this as soon as possible. And all we have are these sort of common symptoms. And we'll see them in all these common remedies that we use. So this is when um, it becomes very, very important to individualize the case, to go to the deepest point possible. And uh, that's how things like the kingdom approach, the superclass, all of these will help uh, narrow down to a specific remedy and help to differentiate between the different remedies. Because normally when we approach such cases, traditionally, there are many different ways of doing it. You know, we have things like drug pictures, remedy essences, therapeutics, the mental state of the patient, myisms, traditional myisms, newer myisms, constitutional types. And all of these can overlap a little bit and become quite confusing. And um, the reproducibility of them also uh, brings, brings itself into question. How uh, confident are we that this approach that we're using will work every time? How confident are we in the remedy that we've given? Even the repertory, which is very important in clinical cases, and we need to use it in such cases, can also be very misleading. If we just look at, uh, you know, a mechanical repertorization, just in the rubric convulsion spasms, we see 700 remedies. Okay, so every, basically every remedy could have a convulsion almost. So it becomes very, very important to have an artistic use of repertory as well. So we need our fundamental knowledge to also be there before we go into things like superclass as well. We need to be confident in the repertory and the use of different repertories as well. And also our knowledge of the Materia Medica and how to use it and to apply it. And this is when our uh, advanced approaches like the synergy in homeopathy becomes very important. This is a wonderful book by Dr. Sankran where he describes the synergy, which is the idea of the genius the symptom and the system. When all three of these things come together, we have a maximum chance of the remedy working. The symptom is uh, what I've just sort of spoken about in brief, you know, in this Materia Medica. Okay, what are the symptoms of the convulsions? And the system is the ideas like the superclass, the kingdom and the miser. And the genius is that thing which runs through the thread of the case, which is central to the case. When we see all of these aspects in the remedy that we choose, we have a much higher confidence. So to start with a case, uh, this was a case um, of a 37 year old male. He had come to Kula um, last year in August. So he started uh, describing his complaint to me. He said that he, his main complaint was actually a headache. Uh, when asking about the headache, he said that uh, he had this throbbing pain on the vertex which was worse from overexertion and stress. And subsequently, he actually then mentioned that, he's, uh, that it had all started after he'd had these epileptic attacks, these convulsions. So I must also add about this clinic that it's very difficult. Um, there are a lot of um, uh, obstacles uh, in a case here because most of these patients, they don't speak English. They're very uneducated. Uh, they don't go to formal education. They speak their native language. So often we'll have a, um, a translator with us. And this creates a lot of obstacles in the case taking as well. How do we understand the patient? But I would also like to emphasize that this, um, this isn't a, a reason to give up and we can still have beautiful results and still apply our system at, um, in these types of cases. So this patient had epilepsy. He's had it since uh, the last four years, and he's also taking medication, but it's not helping him, the medication. Um, most of these patients don't have access to real medical care. They will go to a, a local clinic, which just gives them some sort of allopathic drug uh, prescribed by a nurse. There's no detailed case taking. Um, the help is very, very limited. So. 
going deeper into the symptoms of the convulsions, I ask what happens to him? So it's very important in our case taking as well to understand the pathology of the symptoms and to also know the repertory um, is a huge help in the case taking itself. Because we also know that in the repertory, we see that uh, there are rubrics related to before convulsions, during convulsions, and after convulsions. So this becomes very important to differentiate as well. So we ask him about his symptoms, and he says that usually afterwards he can't recall, he has a memory loss of what exactly happened. But uh, from what people around him have told him and what, from what he finds on waking up, he often finds that he has bitten his tongue and his lips and that it bleeds, he bites it so hard, and that the saliva begins to froth out of the mouth. Just before the attack, he feels very weak and his energy will go down. The whole body will begin to shake. And afterwards, the energy remains very low and he has to go and have a sleep to feel better. He has a lot of tiredness in his arms and there's stiffness in the back of the neck, which is worse when he sleeps on the sides. He finds that he's worse um, for these complaints when he wakes up and that it's always better from massage or deep pressure. Going a bit deeper into the case, um, we asked a little bit about these attacks. And he says that it usually happens after he has some sort of emotional excitement. And he gives us the example of the, the last attack he had was um, when a child in the family was being disrespectful to his grandmother. So he had intervened in this case, and this had caused a sort of uh, a fight in the family. People were arguing. Some people were saying he shouldn't have spoken to the child. It's none of his business. And then uh, other people were standing up. And they caused quite a, a rift in the family. So this made him feel very bad. And with this feeling of guilt and remorse, he then had this attack. This was the most recent attack. He also ex uh, explains from his description, we could work out that he had a hydrocephalus as a child. He described the whole uh, thing of what his parents had told him. He also mentioned to us that he is unemployed and this is causing him a lot of, um, a lot of mental trouble as he's, all he does is he stays at home and looks after his mother, but he feels that he needs a job. He doesn't have and this causes him, causes him a lot of worry. Some of the dreams he gets are repetitive, a very repetitive dream um, is him and his brother having a fight or an argument. And he gets this dream often, and he says it's a bad feeling when he wakes up. He also has the fear of snakes. Now, knowing the community that you're treating is very important as well. So in this community, uh, dreams are very important to them. They're very symbolic and they can mean a lot. So we need to pay attention to dreams, especially here, because it leaves a big impact on the patient. But there are also some very common symptoms. For example, there are snakes everywhere in this community and very poisonous snakes like the black mamba. And people are frequently being bitten and um, having problems with snakes. So something like the fear of snakes becomes slightly less important to us. We should always bear it in mind, but uh, we don't pay too much attention. He tells us that his appetite is good and that he has an aversion to oily food. This causes him a lot of problems. It makes him feel unwell. His sleep is not good. He, he has difficulty falling asleep and he thinks about his brother that had passed away. And this is the same brother that he dreams about having a fight with or an argument. So he often thinks about him. He's constantly worried about his brother. And there's a certain feeling of guilt that he has here. And he has these racing thoughts which prevent him from sleeping. So when we analyze this case, we can take two aspects. We'll take the system aspect and we'll take the symptom. So there's some very clear symptoms that we can see in this case. For example, the frothing and the foaming um, in the mouth during the convulsions. He's biting the tongue. Um, the anger can cause these convulsions. He gets very angry, he tells us as well. And when he's angry, he'll often have the convulsion. And it's not only anger, but any emotional excitement which causes his problems. And he has this um, aggravation from rich and fatty food. 
So these are our symptoms that we could take out of the case. However, just on symptoms alone, we will come to quite a large remedy, uh, group of remedies. There are many convulsion remedies that have these specific symptoms. They're not that unique. There's nothing that unique in this case. This, uh, so therefore, we need to rely on a deeper aspect as well to sort of guide and narrow down our remedy selection. So here, the system part, we can see that he talks about how this had all started, this most recent attack, when the child was being disrespectful to the grandmother. So we can see the issue with the family. And there's also a certain instability in the family, which he spoke about. He said that he felt like the family was going to fall apart. Okay, he had lost that security of the family. And also a lot of guilt. He also talks about being unemployed. He has issues with not having money. He also has the repeated dreams about the facts within the family with his brother and also about his, the same brother who passed away. So we can see uh, issues dealing with the family, with money. We also see the idea of guilt. And now guilt is a very, very important theme in the fourth superclass. We see a lot of remedies in the fourth superclass feel guilty that something is going to happen to them that they have done, which ends up in them losing their stability. So he's going to lose the support of his family. He's lost the support of a job, the financial support. He's lost his, fa uh, his family. He's having this argument with the brother. So we can see the soft hints here at the, the fourth superclass. We can also see within the system idea, the idea of I, his perspective is that of I. I'm not able to support my family. There's something that's gonna to happen to me. I will lose the capability, lose the structure of the family. So we also see the mineral kingdom. And we know that when we study the fourth superclass and the mineral kingdom, we know that it's the fourth row, okay. So then when we look at the, uh, the symptoms, we'll see that the remedy that comes here is cuprum, cuprum metallicum. And we can understand that cuprum is a very important convulsive remedy. We can also see all the features of the fourth row and the fourth superclass, the idea of the family, the idea of guilt as well, the idea of financial instability, the uh, talking about the job security and loss of security. So we can see cuprum is very, uh, is highlighted to us in this, um, in this repertory chart and also going along with the symptom and the system. So um, I don't want to get too much into the potency because this is a very um, rural clinic. So we're very limited in the sort of the resources that we have. So uh, we have very few potencies, especially high potencies, and we rely a lot on what has been donated. So normally we give the potency which we have. And in this case, we only had cuprum 30. So this is what was given. And we also give it in a liquid dose and we give it to them every day because these patients are used to um, going to the clinic and getting their medicine every single day and taking it twice a day. So they are very unhappy and almost suspicious if we don't give them medicine. So we have uh, sort of come up with this method of the liquid and giving it to them twice a day. So don't take too much um, credence to this. Rather do what works for you and the system that you've been studying, but I just wanted to share this with you. So then the patient returned after one month, the remedy that we give usually lasts for about three weeks and we tell them to come back in a month. The patient reported to us that the attacks are shorter. Um, before, every time he had an attack, it would last for 20 minutes or more, but now, it will only happen for about five minutes. And before this, uh, before starting treatment with us, it was happening twice a week, um, if not more. Now it has only happened once a week um, in this last month. The attacks are still happening quite randomly um, as well. He also told us that the dreams of fighting with the brother are not there anymore. All the symptoms of the convulsions um, are the same. There's no new symptoms. Um, it's the same symptoms. They just uh, are now lasting for a shorter um, duration. So this is after one month. So we're very happy with this result. So we repeat the remedy because we can see all the same indications are still there. 
Now, uh, the second month after starting the treatment, he tells us that he only had uh, two attacks in the month. Um, he's no longer biting his tongue and his lips during attacks as well. So he'll have like a, a little bit of a convulsion, but there's no biting, there's no blood. And now it only happens while he's sleeping. So he'll wake up and know that he's had it and he'll just go back to sleep. He also says that the headache that he would get after the attack is no longer there. So um, at this point, he tells us also that uh, there's another symptom that he's having and he's getting cramping pain in the, bodies, uh, in the body after he exerts himself. So this is very good because we understand that this is a cuprum symptom. This isn't anything uh, strange or something we need to worry about. And we can see how he's improving. So we repeat the remedy for another month. So now at the third month of starting treatment, we can see that it's reduced even further. He only had it once in this last month. Um, and he recovers much, uh, much more quicker after the attack. The cramping pains are gone. He says his appetite is good. He sleeps very well now. He doesn't have these thoughts anymore of the brother. He sleeps beautifully. And he's also now had a new dream, which he was very happy about. And he was giving his deceased father some money. So as I mentioned earlier, that dreams are very important in this community. They will go to traditional healers and ask them to discuss their dreams with them. And they're very symbolic. And here he was very happy with this dream, uh, with this idea of giving money, because he felt that he had the ability uh, to support um, his family, to support his father. Um, he had capacity now. So we can see this is what he was lacking before. So this is a very healing dream. So that was after three months, and he actually didn't come back for uh, another three months uh, because he had done so well. And in the next three months um, that occurred, he only had an attack twice. So in a total of three months, there were only two attacks. And this was, he said, because there was some uh, great sort of emotional turmoil in the family, and he got very, very angry, and he had the attack. But it didn't last very long. And there was no bleeding or biting lips, no headache afterwards. And so now he's continuing to follow up. I believe it's been about eight months now um, or something like that. And uh, he's, he no longer takes the epilim. He's, uh, he's convulsive uh, free, convulsion free. And so he's doing uh, remarkably well. And we can see the confidence that we could give Kuprim with by using the symptom and the system. Um, so I've, uh, I'm nearly done. This is a very, very short case, just to show a slightly different um, aspect um, or different superclass. So it's very, very short. This is just a, a nine-year-old female. She had come in July of last year, and she um, also suffering from epilepsy for two years and also been given epilim. So she would have three attacks every single day. And this is very debilitating. And the school had asked to keep her at home because um, she wasn't able to function and she was uh, becoming a, a bit of a problem for the teachers, constantly having to look after her. So uh, this was a big problem for the child. So um, how this would start was that the patient would just be sitting still doing something. They're not moving or up to anything. And then suddenly she would start uh, speaking incomprehensibly and she would just fall down. And when she was down, the head would be moving, but the rest of the body would be very taut and still. And the head was moving very violently and her face would become very distorted and it would be very frightening. The mother was frightened um, looking at her, the scary face that she would pull. And there was a lot of saliva and her eyes would look to the side. This would also come with a headache uh, where there was pain in the left temple and in the vertex. And to ameliorate, she would hit her head very hard which would make her feel better. She also had the unique symptom that things that were near would seem very, very far. Um, this would happen just before um, the, uh, the convulsions would start. She would also have an increase in body temperature. And she noted that whenever there was a lot of noise, if someone shouted or just a slight loud noise, she could instantly be triggered into having an attack. And she would sleep for hours afterwards. And as I said, she had three attacks a day. 
and after the attack, she would be very hungry. So these attacks would come on very, very suddenly, and she would become quite anxious um, throughout the day about having this attack because it was very violent and very sudden for her and very frightening. She didn't like having them at all. So here we can see some symptoms where we see the convulsions from noises. We also see this very unique symptom about how the things that are close appear very far. We see the speech is affected. She has the anxiety before the convulsions. Uh, again, this uh, idea of objects appearing far and the motion of the head during the convulsion. Then in the system, we can see the plant kingdom. Something happens, some noise happens, and she is affected and she has this convulsion. She's very sensitive to outside things. And something would happen. And we also see the idea of sudden and violence, both in her experience of it and also in the symptoms that appear. They're very sudden and very violent. So when we um, look at, uh, at the repertory, we see the remedy secuta coming. And we know the remedy secuta is very, very good for convulsions. But if we understand our, our system, we can even understand even more importantly why secuta is the, most, uh, is the best remedy in this case. The secuta falls in the umbelliferae family, which is the sixth, uh, uh, sixth subclass of the plants, the asteroids, which is, falls in the sixth superclass. Okay, and in the umbelliferae, we see the main theme is of sudden violent attack. Um, and, it's a, and a lot of the remedies in here are about, uh, you know, we can see epilepsy, we can see sudden violence, accidents, um, sudden things that happen very quickly, attack, as if being attacked from behind, very suddenly. So we can see the umbelliferae. And we can see this is the sixth uh, subclass of the plants. And we can see the different orders here. So we'll see the Solanaceae. But the main theme in the Solanaceae is the terror and the fright. So the main emphasis in this case isn't about the terror and the fright. It's about the sudden violence, which is the umbelliferae. In the uh, Loganaceae or the Genshaniales, we see the shock, um, which isn't there in this case either. She doesn't uh, experience this as a shock. We don't see the scrofularioles seen as separation, as trauma or fear. We don't see the alertness of the rubioles like coffee. We don't see the thrill or the sexuality of the lamioles like um, uh, oregonum, for example. And we don't see the dipsical suffocation or the asteroles injury. The main emphasis in this uh, subclass that we saw in this case was the idea of sudden violence. And therefore we're very, very confident when we give Secuta. So again, uh, about the potency, we just gave the 30. And the, the results are amazing. Um, we didn't see anyone for about three months. The patients often can't get to us. Money is a difficulty. They can't afford the transport. They can't uh, leave their jobs. But anyway, the mother was also a patient and she had come to the clinic and she had reminded me that I was also treating her daughter. So when I looked up the daughter's uh, case file, I saw this case and I remembered it. So I asked her, how is the daughter doing? And she said that after starting the remedy, the convulsions had completely stopped. Uh, they finished the remedy and uh, for three months that when the mother had come, there hadn't been a single attack. So um, following this, the mother still comes to the clinic. I've seen her follow-ups. Um, she's come for more than six months and she's also doing well. But uh, the child hasn't come back because she hasn't needed a single uh, repeat of the remedy. The convulsions have completely stopped. As, as suddenly and violently as they came, they also suddenly went. And this um, has, we can be confident of the reproducibility of these results with um, using this idea of the system, the symptom and the genius. Someone has asked what 5GTT BD means, that means five drops twice a day because it's in a liquid. We do it like a plussing method. But as I said, it's not that important. The main idea that I want to give you is the idea of remedy selection, case analysis. And so, um, you know, I, I saw this quote about the Sankaran masterclass. Uh, we need to be firm in our own fundamentals, the existing body of information. But this is only one part. We need to be aware of all the new work that is taking place in homeopathy. 
And if we familiarize ourselves with both of these aspects, the traditional and the contemporary, we are able to put them together and we are able to give the results to our patients, which they seek from us. And so this is what I was trying to show you today, the fundamentals of symptoms, symptomatology, materia medica, uh, repertory. Repertory was also very helpful in these cases. And also the newer aspects, the superclass, the subclasses, the kingdoms. I didn't show any my uh, myism aspects in these cases, but that is also very important. And I've worked a lot on the, the Sankaran masterclass as well. I, 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 was help, uh, I helped putting it together. And so I've seen all of these lectures and these were very formative along with my other education with the other song and sort of uh, learning all of this. And so I would highly recommend this course if you want to learn about subclass, superclass, WISE, and also the fundamentals, the repertory, the material medica. This will be extremely helpful in your practice and give you the confidence to prescribe remedies and to uh, know that not only does, the do, does homeopathy work and give good results, but that it uh, does it so repeatedly and reproducibly. And so there's also a discount, I believe, this week um, on the Sankaran Masterclass. There's a 25% discount. So I, I would re recommend this uh, course highly to everyone. And um, if there are any questions or queries about the superclass, about the cases, um, any aspect, uh, people are more than welcome to be in contact with me. Um, I'd be very happy to uh, answer all the questions. I've gone quite a bit over my time. I'm very sorry about that. So I'll hand over quickly now. So yes, thank you so much for the wonderful session, sir, for giving us a brief idea of new approach superclass. What are the different six superclasses? And by explaining them through a few cases. Thank you so much, sir.